Welcome to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on uh, nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I would like to welcome my guest today, Lizney Tate, the executive director for Helping Women, period. It's so nice to be here, Paul. Thank you. Oh, you are so welcome. And I'm going to just start off the bat. Tell me, what is your mission with Helping Women, period? Well, our mission is to provide free menstrual products to those experiencing homelessness and low-income disparity in the Michigan area. So, pretty simple. Like, we just give out free pads and tampons. (laughs) Well, that's fair enough. (laughs) Obviously, this is a... This is a need for you to start a whole organization around. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm going to back up a little bit to a conversation we had where you said this phrase. You said, I want to work myself out of a job. Oh, it's so true. What does that mean? (laughs) That means that um, pads and tampons and menstrual Equity is an integral part to our community, and we need to make sure that those products are free. Are provided. They need to be provided for when people need them. So, like, not everybody needs free pads and tampons. I don't think we need to be like Scotland because it's a little smaller than we are. And, but I think in the same places you would find toilet paper, you need to find these products so that anyone who has a period and they weren't expecting it can take care of themselves. Um, I think it's really a public health issue, you know, because I don't want people having those issues in public. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, I think there are many other ways we can deal with this as a society so that I don't have to be doing what I'm doing. Although I love doing what I'm doing. I'm not not knocking that at all. But I think um, there's so much that can happen so that I don't, that helping women period doesn't have to be around. Well, well, what's interesting (laughs) to me is like, obviously this isn't something that would be um, something that I would face Mm -hmm. because of who I, you you know, and, and where does this stem from? What, I mean, you'd figure that this would be something that. Oh, well, there is a stigma against periods Mm -hmm. and people have not wanted to talk about periods for a long, long time. Um, then I think in a lot of the laws that were passed when um, they were creating things like WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, and SNAP, um, the people who were in charge were men, and they didn't think about it because no one talked about it. And so I don't think anybody had an evil intent to not provide those things to the people that need them. I think it's just the way it was. It just didn't even come across on their radar. So, I mean, I think that's why we're where we are now. Um, Because WIC doesn't provide pads and tampons. They don't provide diapers. And those are two things that you'd think, uh, you know, a program called Women, Infants, and Children would provide. Um, Those are the, that's what, that's one of the biggest things they need. Um, So, yeah. (laughs) Well, it's just, it's just, you know, like I said, to me, um, it just sounded like common sense, but obviously that's not like, like the provision of the situation of it just didn't. And it was like, man, I can't. And the fact that you had to start an organization to um, to combat this misinformation, mm-hmm. uh, to um, do the advocacy work, to to provide a. Um, avenue Mm -hmm. to receive these products in the 21st century is is mind-boggling so were you or are you one of the founders of this organization oh yeah yeah i was i had a co-founder i um founded it with amy stevenson and um we didn't really even mean to start a nonprofit. um we just wanted to have like a one and done kind of thing we were going to have a breakfast and invite 30 of our friends and raise some money buy some products off of Amazon and give it to Haven House, one of the local shelters. And um, 
we put it on Facebook on a Sunday, and on Tuesday we had 100 people coming to the breakfast, not 30. And on Thursday we filed nonprofit paperwork because we had people from all over the world who wanted to donate money to us because they saw the Facebook posts. And um, we wanted to be as transparent as possible. So, you know, there's everybody knows somebody and loves somebody who's had a period, right? And everybody who's had a period has had that time when they haven't had the product that they needed. And we all know that sinking feeling in the pit of our stomach, like, what are we going to do? We're going to, you know, find a machine or whatever. But most of us can go home and take care of ourselves and clean ourselves up and we have clean clothes and it's fine. But there's a, you know, there's 400,000 women and girls under the fe- who live in Michigan under the federal poverty line. So they don't have that ease. They don't have that kind of backup to have product under the sink. They don't have an extra pair of jeans, for example. There's, you know, there's, it's just such a huge need and such an easy way to take care of people and help them be self-sufficient. Really? Well, I mean, and so with that, I'm going (laughs) to grab onto a little bit of what you said there, where you said you had these, you had three times as many people show up to this breakfast Mm -hmm. that you expected. And so the next day you filed your nonprofit paperwork. Right. Right. Um, let's talk about that conversation <laughs> well, and what, how that, how that um, situation we, went. We didn't realize that it was going to be so universal and so um, touch such a nerve with so many people. I mean, it touched a nerve with us because we had mm-hmm. never thought about this, and um, we're like, "Well, we have to do something." And so then we looked at each other, and Amy's worked for um, a law firm, so it was pretty easy to fill out that paperwork. But we're like, yeah, we need to cover all the bases, and here we go. And those first two years were just extremely reactive. You know, like, oh, well, we've got all this product. We can't just give it to Haven House. They only have so much room, so let's work with other groups around that um, have contact with the people that are, like, our target market. And um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's where we started, and it's only been, like, we've been around since 2015. Mm-hmm. So it's, we're just starting to really be more strategic about what we're doing and, like, look at a, at the bigger picture. Like, what else can we do to help this? And started working in advocacy this summer um, to get the tampon tax removed. And my next thing is to try and get free product in the high schools because we shouldn't have people not going to school because they don't have the product that they need here in the 21st century, right? (laughs) In Michigan, Mm -hmm. it shouldn't, that shouldn't be one of the reasons they don't go to school. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Well, in those first days, Mm -hmm. what was the, what was like the biggest thing you learned starting this, starting this as an organization (laughs) and moving forward? I mean, what was like, what was that like? What was it like to be in the room? Um, Looking back, I wish we had a plan, you know, like a business plan or something like that. We were just kind of riding the wave, you know. We just, okay, well, we got, you know, we had that breakfast. We raised $4,000, and we're like, so what can we do next? Like, how can we make this money go the farthest? And then we just kept looking at each other going, I can't believe people sent us $100 to do this, you know. it was It was very humbling and kind of shocking to just keep having that support and all these people saying we want to help you we want to do this we want you know this is so important and um then finally meeting people that we were trying to help and how happy they were to get these products like people would cry when we handed products to them and it was just amazing just you know what was it like to build the infrastructure that you needed to build to build so that you could transport <laughs> this material? I mean, because that's what really amazes me because, I mean, you have a staff of very little. I think it's just you. It's just me and some volunteers, yeah. yeah. And, and it's mostly volunteer run. Yeah. And you cover quite a bit of ground. Mm-hmm. We um, The whole time we were doing this, we wanted to be as, like I said, transparent. That was like our 
our keyword for that first year. And we wanted to be able to make sure that anyone else could copy what we were doing, like totally into open source software. You know, that's what, that's what we wanted to do. And, um, realizing that we have to keep track of every single tampon that comes in and out of our, um, our storage unit, for example, we had, I had to learn about software, about spreadsheets. And I was an English teacher. I did not like spreadsheets. Even now I just roll my eyes and, you know, get through it. But, um, you know, just trying to figure out how do you keep all this stuff clear and how do you, um, how do you keep track of all these things and how can you get the product that you need to the places that need it rather than just handing it out on the streets, for example, because while I would, it's just not as efficient as giving it to food banks and domestic violence shelters and those kinds of groups. Because they already had that relationship with the people that we were looking mm -hmm. to help. So it just made more sense. Now, talk to me about um, creating the partnerships you needed to mm -hmm. create with other nonprofits, with other organizations. How, how was that relationship building with that? Oh, that is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> like if I could just go talk to people all the time, my life would be perfect. Mm. Um, and we really thought that that was the best way to do it. Like we wanted to be um, unobtrusive to these groups. You know, we didn't want it. We knew they were all doing great things like Haven House is doing great things. And we wanted to be able to just bring in product and drop it off and leave without making a big fanfare and without interrupting the way they already had their business going because, you know, they were all established and we were brand new. So um, even now, we do a lot of delivery to people as soon as they place their order. I have a bunch of volunteers that will take stuff out and deliver it instead of making them come to us and pick up their product. And so, I mean, it, that was, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, partnering is key to the way we do what we do. And you are in a community that is really big on the, the partnerships mm -hmm. aspect of it. And so... Um, who are some of the key yeah. players that have helped you distribute the products you have to give? Uh, well, the first one is Mishko, Michigan company. They're a janitorial supply company, and they're in Old Town. And um, when he first heard what we were doing, uh, Kirk, um, he said, I have a daughter. I can't imagine her not having the product she needs. I will sell you what you need at wholesale rates as long as you buy 100 cases at a time. And we were like that first, that breakfast, we were just hoping to make 500 and buy two cases. We thought, well, okay, well, we'll do 100 cases. And we kept them in our car and in our house and figured out how to distribute them. But really, we can supply one person's menstrual needs for an entire year for $35. And that's all down to buying our product from Mishko. So really, like I've got to give them huge props because that's how we can do what we do. Did you just say $35 for the year? Yep. Yep. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's last year we distributed 740,000 items, which is about 22,000 periods. Oh. So that's, you know, that, and it's about, I don't know, $3 per period, but yeah. So $35 will cover one person for a year. And so, we're very lucky that we have this partnership with Mishko and that he's been so supportive throughout, you know, the last seven years. <laughs> so that's, that's one big one. The other one is um, Storage Sense, which is also an old town, and they've donated a storage unit to us. So we really couldn't work as efficiently as we do without them. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that's So what is your area what, what where do you do you reach i mean i know that it's it's probably limited to the bodies you can get on on the ground so what it is but we're um we distributed to eight counties last year um mostly ingham eaton clinton shiawassee um genesee uh, some others to the south um but we're taking over grand rapids we're doing some in kent county this this year, my friend runs another nonprofit, and she wants to 
she's got other job commitments and marriages and stuff coming up. So she wants to just get out of the business. And so we're going to go and help see what we can do in that area. And then um, I'm also trying to figure out, like, I talked to some people at the UP and there are schools up there. There's 15 schools that have girls that aren't going to school because they don't have, you know, the product they need and it's hard to get up there. So I want to do a tampon tour of the UP. That's my next <laughs> thing. But we'll see. We'll see. Like I, I focus mainly in mid Michigan, but But I think that's just because that's where you're based. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Well, that's that's really that's really cool. I know that one of my favorite stories was one that we we got to play a part in, kind of, uh, to develop a video for <laughs> you uh, about Mahin and mm -hmm. his family, um, and just talk a little bit about yep. that story. Oh well, Crystal Ray has been one of our uh, Crystal Ray Community Center has mm -hmm. been one of our partners since the very beginning as well, and um, we were really looking for more stories because. I only see clients um, in the mobile food banks, and that's, you know, 30 seconds, do you want pads or tampons, and then go. I can't, I don't have that relationship with them. And Crystal Ray had a great relationship with some of their clients. And Mahin was really interested in helping us tell the story about why he needed period products and for his family. And it was, it was wonderful. That was such a great video. Hmm. And... It was great to meet him and hear what, you know, what the impact is. Because when you're at the desk all the time looking at the stupid spreadsheets, <laughs> you don't really, like, you see numbers moving, but you don't see people. Right. That's, well, so. let's talk a little bit about um, being at the desk. Just recently, you took on the role of the executive director. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so how did you feel, how did you feel about that going in? Oh, well. Amy and I had been co-executive directors since the beginning, so it wasn't okay. it wasn't that much of a difference. But trying to do all the things that she was doing before, like social media and um, that, yeah, it was just it was it's just a lot. <laughs> like even now, I'm like, I wish I had eighty hours in the week rather than because I have so much to do. I mean, I've, I I can do enough during the week to keep everything going. Right. But there's so much more I could do with strategic planning and with taking care of my donors a little bit more than I do right now. And um, like just how else we could do things better. You know, sometimes it takes, you have to like kind of step back and go, well, this is the way we've always done it. Is this the right way? Is it the best way? Is there another way we could do what we're doing and get the same result or a better result and uh, you know there's a lot of assumptions that we make in like especially with helping women period we made a bunch of assumptions when we started and they weren't valid you know like I thought there were going to be a lot more actually homeless people living on the streets mm -hmm. in Lansing that we would help and there's not as many as I thought there's a lot of functionally homeless people who have you know they're living on people's couches or they're, you know, they're in transitional housing or whatever. There's a lot more of that. So when we first started, we thought, oh, well, we need to give personal wipes to everyone because they're not going to be near running water and they'll need this to take care of themselves. And really that seemed to be, it ended up that only the places that had baby pantries were taking the wipes and we didn't have a lot mm. going out to individuals. So then we thought, well, We'll just not do that anymore because they're expensive and they're heavy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, people weren't using them the way we thought. So that was one of the things we took out of our stream. What but, was the, th other than that, what was one of the things that you wanted to tackle when you had to take on the reins fully? Um, Another thing that I would love to, like, I don't know, I haven't done it yet, but it's still in my plans, but is um, education. And, you know, the whole advocacy portion I wasn't interested in in the first couple of years because we were just trying to get stuff out. But just giving pads and tampons is not part of, um, it's just a Band-Aid, mm -hmm. really. It's not taking care of the problem. It's just 
taking care of the symptom. And so I started to realize that really I need to make my voice for good and do some more advocacy and kind of get rid of the problem so then I don't have to just give Band-Aids all the time. Wow, that's a great segue. <laughs> because the reason this, the, the next segment is uh, really about why I brought you back for mm-hmm. the second season um, because of the major inroads that you made that were I, I wanted to draw, draw attention to. And one of those is the, uh, the as you mentioned, the tampon tax mm-hmm. and then the legislation and, and going to the house or the, the wherever you went. I'm oh, not, I went to the both. Yeah. So <laughs> the whole, the whole shebang, talk a little bit about yeah. that process and, and how you felt about how that all went. Cause it kind of went your way. And it did go my way. Yes. And it was, it was very frustrating. I mean, it's exciting, right? It's, <laughs> it's but the, I think that's the way government is, is that it's, Always, you have to take two steps, and then you have to take two steps in a different direction, not necessarily back, but just you have to keep going around and around until you get the answers that you want. But um, I was working with a group called MyPad, which is Michigan Period Action Day, and um, it's just a consortium of other groups like mine in Michigan and actually in the rest of the U.S. that were trying to get the tampon tax repealed. And um, one of the things that really helped... um, the government legislators in the state have been trying to repeal this tax for the last nine years. And it just kept going to committee and dying and going to committee and dying. And somebody else would propose it and we'd go to committee and die. So we were trying to figure out, well, why is it doing that? And how else can we attack, you know, explain that this is what really needs to happen? And then because of COVID, then the CARES Act of 2020, which was May 2020, um, the IRS decided that menstrual products were actually medical, essential, essential medical devices. So they'd never said that before. The FDA had said they were essential and said they were medical devices, but the IRS did not. So once that CARES Act was passed, people could take the purchase of their um, menstrual, like they could buy them through their federal savings account or their health savings account and not have to pay taxes on them that way. And so because the IRS said that there was a medical, an essential item, then the state of Michigan's tax law says essential items cannot be taxed. So they were kind of going against, they were kind of, it was an illegal tax at that point because the federal government said it was essential. And so it just took a little convincing to get um, other legislators on board. And it was very helpful that we had um, a Republican who is interested in pushing this forward too. So um, Brian Posthumus presented a bill and that that I think because we had bipartisan support, it was easier to pass because it wasn't just a right. bleeding heart liberal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to do this for people because it's a good thing. I mean, it was, it, and he even said that it was common sense in his testimony. So, um, yeah, they they were asking for people to testify, and I'm like, I can talk about pads and tampons <laughs> and how important they are. <laughs> I'll do it. So that's yeah, awesome. it was, it so, was fun. Well, I mean, that's a huge uh, that's a huge W in the, mm-hmm. in your um, journey into the advocacy realm. Yeah, I mean that was that was, that was pretty that was pretty awesome to see from my standpoint and I think obviously your standpoint and the and and mm-hmm. hearing finally hearing the, the voices of those who are saying, uh, come on. Yeah. Uh hello. So <laughs> so I mean it makes me wonder if that because essential was a buzzword of the last couple of years. It, mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like, oh, now everybody's hearing the word essential. Obviously it means important now. Right. Well and you know this the power of how you tell the story, right? Like, yeah. uh, one of the things we were told by our friends who are lobbyists before we went in to do the testifying was, don't say anything gross. <laughs> you know, like don't don't make it. Just be clinical. It's it's a medical necessity. Mm-hmm. Period. End of story. And um, so, I mean, that was I think that was helpful too. And there are some people who would be swayed by 
you know, there's people using socks instead of pads and tampons. We need to do something. Um, but then, you know, just being clinical seemed to move everyone in our direction. So, wow. yeah. Well, on top of that, because <laughs> we're not done with the, the, the rolling out here, it was uh, um, that piece of legislation, I think, kind of helped propel you to be noticed by somebody in particular or somebody's organization in particular. <laughs> we'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's probably more and, accurate. Uh, you got a um, kind of like your photos in a little bit of a spread in O, o Magazine. Yeah. Um, talk about that. Yep. How was how was that? Was that a little vindication for you as well? Oh, it was. It was shocking. It's really hard to not discount it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's easy for me to say I just answered an email. Like <laughs> somebody called me and I just answered, and we just talked about what I do. But the fact is that I've worked really hard for the last six and a half years, mm -hmm. and. Um, being willing to talk to anyone about what we do and how we do it and why it's important, I think is really, I think that was part of what propelled me to their notice. You know, it's, um, I still can't believe it sometimes, you know, <laughs> I look at it and go, Oh, look at that. <laughs> but. Well, I mean, what was the, I mean, once you got the, notification that this was going to happen what were, mm -hmm. what were the next steps what what was the whole rollout um there really wasn't she called the editor called me and we inter had an interview and then she said somebody's going to need pictures so you know send me some pictures and or actually her the photographer person sent me information and I had to send some photos in and it was really kind of funny because they're like we need pictures with your face showing I'm like, it's been a pandemic for the last two years. I've had a mask on everything. The only thing I could send her were like selfies. Oh, yeah. And um, then I had some um, headshots done, so I sent one of those in. But yeah, and then I just, they're like, oh, it's coming out on January 4th. And I didn't really believe it until I actually held one of the magazines in my hand. Oh. And, <laughs> and it's it's very... It's very exciting, and I can't wait. Like, I've talked to so many people since, mm -hmm. you know, been on a couple other podcasts and had um, just people calling me from different places trying to figure out how we can um, promote what Helping Women Period does and other groups like mine that are across the nation so we can solve this problem. <laughs> well, and I think that you took the right tact in recognizing where the band-aid was versus where the actual issue is mm -hmm. and that is in the knowledge and uh um the advocacy work so what is your next goal miss advocate <laughs> my next goal is to get product in schools i've had like in the last two months i've delivered forty thousand items to different schools across mid michigan and um you know, like I said, the tampon tour up in the UP, they have 78 schools there in the UP that need product. You know, that's just, it just seems like this is one of the very basic blocks we could give to schools to make sure that people, you know, the kids that are in there are, have all the things they need. You know, there's the whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you need food and shelter and you need period products so that you can go to school. <laughs> So that's that's my next big goal. And so what about you? Mm -hmm. You personally, I mean, with all this work that you've done for the last, like you said, six and a half years mm -hmm. on the hard work, the long hours, the long days, what do you do to escape? What do you what do you do to <laughs> decompress? What, what, what are the um, things? Do you read? Do you go watch movies? What do you do? Yes, I read. I watch movies. <laughs> In the before times, I would go to listen to live music because that's amazing and I have so much fun. Um, but yeah, I read voraciously. I love science fiction. I love history. I love, I mean, there's just, I'll read anything. I mean, I was an English teacher before, so, you know, it's kind of a, a habit that I've created. But, and I love watching 
TV. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's that's a good decompression mm-hmm. situation for myself. But um, who's your favorite author or what's your favorite book? I can't. I don't have a favorite book. Okay. I that's can't. Fair. I can't do that because I like them all the same. Right now, I'm on a Lindsay Baroker kick. She's a sci-fi writer, and she's written, I don't know, 30-some. And it's very kind of pulpy, and I can read it quickly, and I nice. love it. So um, she also has very strong female characters and characters that have um, that are non-traditional. So there was a character with um, Asperger's in one of her sh- in one of her series, and it was awesome. It's just you could read everything from his point of view and so much fun. So nice. nice. Yeah. So if anybody wants to connect with you at helping mm-hmm. women period, where's the best place for them to go? Um, our website, helping women period.org. Um, we're on all the social medias and you can always send me an email at helping women period at gmail.com. So great. Well, thank you very much for joining me on this uh, episode uh, Lizney, really appreciate you being able to come back. Well, thanks for having me. It's been fun. All right. And thank you all again for taking some time to listen to our program. So don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple of weeks. And if there is someone you know of that you would like to hear about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. Thank you all and see you next time in the Control Center. Goodbye.